I was a pastor before I was ever an involved church member. Yeah, truth. I, I, and I was a member of a church. I was in a Bible college and seminary, and I, but I was driving two hours where I was working with a youth group. I was a youth director, and, but, but it, you know, I was a member of the church, but I was too far away to really be involved. So I'd never actually seen how a church operates and how decisions are made or how people got along or didn't get along or any of that stuff until I was supposed to be leading it. And uh, it, it was tough. I mean, I, I had no clue. I had no clue. Now, I went to Bible college, went to seminary, but they teach you really well about what the Bible says, and you get all this theological training, but things like leading and overseeing a budget and working with elders, building relationships, small group ministry, all that stuff. We didn't learn that stuff. And uh, so I, I decided I'd better start reading some books. And the best books that I read were by older pastors that had long-term effective ministries. One of my favorite authors was Leslie Flynn. He had recently retired when I was just getting started and was just a wealth of information and wisdom. And around that time, there were some like-minded younger pastors around the state. This was in Wisconsin, central or southern Wisconsin. But younger guys around the state that were also like-minded, and we started a gathering at our church, at our, at our location, and, and we started inviting some older pastors in. And when I say older pastors, I'm not saying older as in how old I am right now. I'm talking about guys that were really old, that were retired. Uh, one was Carl F.H. Henry, if you have ever heard that name. He, he was the founding editor of Christianity Today. It goes back into the 50s. He was also one of the founders of TEDS, or Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, one of, the, one of the founders of that. A brilliant, brilliant mind. He was in his 90s, and he came and met with us as a group of pastors. We also had a guy named Chuck Wood who came from central Indiana, drove all the way just to hang out with us, and I still remember some of the things that he taught us that I, I live by, I practice, I do ministry based on some of those things. Huge impact. I think and I believe that this is why many young parents struggle. Too much pride to admit that they need help when it comes to parenting. And they all say, hey, I have no clue what I'm doing, but they don't reach out for help. And I think that's why a lot of marriages struggle. Very little outreach, trying to get some help until it's like a major problem, and then they try to get some help, and, all, and sometimes that's too late. I think that's also one of the reasons why we struggle in our Christian lives. We have so many seasoned and wise, godly Christians here at the bridge. And when I was a young believer, I needed and was benefited by Christians who were ahead of me, and you would as well. Well, today, we're gonna go back to our roots, to the earliest of Christians, and we're gonna learn some lessons from them. So we're in Acts chapter two. You wanna grab your Bibles and turn with us. We're gonna be projecting some of the scriptures, but not all of them, so you're gonna to wanna to have a Bible. And in fact, if you're watching online, you're gonna to wanna to have a Bible as well, unless you're, I don't think you're driving in a car watching online. That, that doesn't usually work. But grab a Bible. It's page 909 if you don't have a Bible of your own. You wanna use one of those blue hardcover Bibles, page 909. And then also we got notes, notes in the bulletin as well as on the app. Really helpful to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We believe this is true. We receive what it says. In the name of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit, open our hearts and engage our minds. Amen. Well, since we were last in Acts, which was just last week, a week has passed for them as well. In fact, almost exactly a week. In Jerusalem, things were starting to get back to normal, but it was still a buzz with everything that had taken place over the last couple of months because it was a big deal. This Jesus had come in for the Passover week and all that took place during that week and then his condemnation and crucifixion and broken hearts and then the talk of his resurrection and a lot of people in Jerusalem had even seen him alive afterwards. And it was a major deal, but they still had all of the requirements, the demands of life. And getting back to the demands of life causes us sometimes to put those things on the back burner. But I'm sure there were still lots of questions. Have you heard any more? Have you heard any more from the, these followers of Jesus from Galilee? And do you know what's going on there? At the same time, there's this small group of followers of Jesus who had witnessed his ascension into heaven. They knew that he res was resurrected. And they were doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. He's, he said, I'm going to send you out as witnesses, but first, I want you to wait. And so they're waiting. They had no idea how long they were supposed to wait. They just knew that they were supposed to wait. And so a week later, we read in verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived. Now, we actually talked in detail about Pentecost and the meaning of it last spring in our After Effects series, the After Effects of Jesus' Resurrection. 
And so I encourage you to go back if you want to learn more about this, go back to that message and listen to that. And this is the giving of the Holy Spirit. We talked a lot about the Holy Spirit in that message as well. And of course, the Holy Spirit is the, the we, we call him a third person of the Trinity, but it's not like first, second, and third. He's one of the Trinity and he's a big deal. And he came Jesus sent him so that we could get, receive his guidance and so that we could be filled with his power to be able to accomplish the ministry he gives us. But today we're going to be hitting at a little bit different angle, and uh, I think that it's going to be important for us to see what we see as we talk about the birth of the church. So we see when the day of Pentecost has come, that word Pentecost, it actually, Pente is 50, cost is days, so it literally means 50 days, 50 days after Passover. So this was, and that's how we can figure out the timing of how long Jesus had, uh, after he'd been ascended, how long they had to wait. We just do the calculations. So this is 50 days after the Passover. It's actually, and maybe you don't know what happened 50 days after the first Passover. Remember, Passover was the commemoration of the death angel passing over them in Egypt. It was the night that they were released from captivity when they started heading towards the promised land. And 50 days later, they were encamped at Mount Sinai, when Moses went up into the mountain and received the law of God. So this is a celebration of the giving of the law of God. That's what Pentecost was. It continues, uh, they were all together in one place. Now the they, who's the they? Well, that's, that's Jesus' OG group. Those are his tight followers. And some wonder, is this just the 12 or is this the 120? And we don't necessarily know this. Um, we are suspecting because of the time of day, it's probably his, his group of about 120 that were kind of gathering together on a regular basis and they would have gone to the temple for their time of prayer. It says in one place. And there's a lot of speculation over that one place. Where is the place when they were, where they were gathered together? And some, many have said, in fact, I think historically, this is what I was taught, was that it was in the upper room that upper room where Jesus had given the Passover meal, was the host of the Passover meal for his disciples, which was the beginning of communion, and it was in that upper room where they were waiting when, when the Holy Spirit came. Um, but it doesn't tell us that. And there's some fascinating archaeology that has come surrounding that whole upper room thing. There's, there's this really old synagogue in Old City, Jerusalem. It's very, very old. And it, it faces the temple, which all synagogues did back in the day. All of the synagogues that we have unearthed in archaeology, they all face towards the temple. It's what they did, facing towards this holy presence of God. But the interesting thing about this synagogue is that it's got a foundation basement to it. And the basement doesn't face towards the temple. It's like offset, which is almost unheard of. Offset, and it faces instead towards the Holy Sepulcher, where most scholars believe that Jesus was buried and came back from the, from the dead, facing towards the place of Jesus' resurrection. Now, that's not all. They unearthed this engraving in that, in, on pottery that they have found in that level, which they believe goes back to the late first century. They unearthed... Uh, what we think is probably one of the earliest Christian symbols, if not the earliest Christian symbol. That you see the menorah and the Star of David and the fish symbol. And this is long before the cross was ever viewed as a symbol of Christianity. That didn't come until the fourth, fourth century. There were a number of other symbols for Christianity, the fish being the oldest, but we also see this. In fact, Junior's got it tattooed on his hand. This was a very early Christian symbol. And so there's a lot of speculation that, you know, why would there be a building used for worship with a Christian symbol facing the Holy Sepulcher? So some believe this was the upper room and this was a place. And that's what the, the Christians did. They, these early Christians, they would build places of worship or meet as places of worship in very special places that had to do with the life of Jesus. That's why we think we know where Peter's house was in Capernaum, where Jesus stayed many times, because it was a very, very early church that was built there, or, put to, or, or pra they practiced worship there, just basically, again, by the engravings that we've been able to find. So it could have been, could have been there. Trouble is, uh, we just don't know. It's fascinating, and as, and as fascinating as this is, it's hard to believe that you could get 120 people into that little, what would have been the upper room. It just isn't big enough. 
And then when you consider the 3,000 people that are going to, we'll see, will come to faith on this day, there's no place where they could have been, where they could have heard Peter, even in the streets, they, they could not have gathered there. So there's another place that I think is more likely because of the time of the day, and we know that the habit of the disciples and the early Christians was to go to the temple for the time of prayer, and this takes place right during that time that there's a, I think it was on Solomon's porch, which is on the temple. A lot of places in the temple, Temple Mount was a huge area, and Solomon's porch would, was a likely place where a, plot, a lot of people would gather, and if they went here for prayers, and then this, what, take, what is about to take place, transpired, happens, There would have been plenty of room there for thousands of people to gather to hear Peter's famous sermon. Well, the thing is, Luke doesn't say, because the event is more important than the place. So what's the event? Well, if you got your Bibles, and continue following along here. We get down to verse two. It says, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, the sound of a rushing, mighty wind, not the effects, not the wind itself. It's just the sound. This is miracle number one. There's going to be three miracles that will take place here that will grab people's attention. And just the sound would cause people to come running and to look and see what, what, it, what is happening in there. Why is there this, this hurt, this almost a tornado sound coming from this room, and yet we don't see the effects? And what happens after this? I mean, a lot of Christians get amped up about, and they want, they want to repeat it. But something to keep in mind as we read this is what's about to happen is abnormal. Not a new normal, it's abnormal, and that's the point. That's the point of a miracle, is it's not something that is repeated. I mean, look in verse three, we read, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now listen, if you've been around church world for a while, you already know this, and so maybe you're even zoning out. Because, okay, I know they got tongues of fire on their head and I've seen pictures of it. But uh, if you're new and you've never heard the story before, it's like, what? That, that's a little weird. Why fire? And I used to just write it off, think, well, it's just a miracle. You know, to get people's attention. But th- there's a lot more to this. You think about this. What was Jerusalem celebrating right now at this time? Pentecost, which was the giving of the law. What happened when God gave the law? If you remember, when Moses was up on Sinai, the mountain was consumed with fire. The Israelites understood this as the presence of God, symbolic of the presence of God. And then as they were wandering through the wilderness, fire led them. This was the Shekinah glory of God. And then it rested over the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and later in the temple Fire signified the presence of God. And now while they were celebrating this very thing, this fire appears on their heads, which is awesome. And it's showing how the fire of God is not out there, but the fire of God, the presence of God is coming to each of you at the same time as these guys were receiving the Holy Spirit. So three miracles, sound of rushing wind, no, no effects, just the sounds, the tongues of fire. And then if you look at verse four, you see that these 12 apostles all begin speaking in all different languages. And these are languages that these men had never studied or would not have known miraculous ability to be able to speak foreign languages, which is incredible. In fact, starting in verse 8, it lists out all these languages understood by the foreign Jews who were in Jerusalem for the festival. They were, they were gathered there from other nations surrounding, and even though they were Jews, they had their own home languages that they would speak when they were home, and now they're hearing these in their own languages, Parthian and Asian and, and Latin and Arabic and Egyptian. And they're thinking there's this group of people speaking their language, celebrating God. I mean, this isn't just some weird occurrence. There's deep meaning and beauty to God's strategy. It's this here that puts God's story into different languages and helps us to understand the nature of the growth of God's church. These people will leave Jerusalem and take the gospel in their own language back to their hometowns and things start brewing around the empire. And the people watching, and and they're about to hear Peter's message. I mean, this will set the stage for the coming missionary journeys that we're going to be studying in the book of Acts in the weeks we have to come. 
Our God is so thoughtful, strategic, and intentional. He doesn't just do random stuff. And this is just a small peek into his mind. It's incredible. So now we jump down into verse 14, and you see that Peter, he stands up in the midst of the crowd. And I can't help but think, knowing Peter's personality, I mean, he's been chomping at the bit for this. I mean, he's, he's been rearing to go. It was seven weeks exactly that Peter had denied Jesus in these very streets and then hid away. In fact, for days, he swam in guilt over it until Jesus, after his resurrection, pursued him and called him back. And since then, you know Peter's been like a racehorse in a gate. I mean, he's just, he's just waiting for his second shot. But Jesus told him to wait. And now's the time. So Peter stands and preaches at the very place where he had denied Jesus. Because Christianity is a faith of second, third, and fourth chances. I've experienced it. I know a lot of you have as well. <laughs> I, I wish... I could have seen the resolute look on his face as he steps up. I mean, to hear for the first time, an imperfect man, but now filled with the Holy Spirit. Prior to this, scared like a little puppy, and now standing with boldness, sharing the message of Jesus in clarity and confidence would have made the hair on the back of your neck stand up. All right, look at verse 37. Down in 37. It says, now when they heard that they were when they heard this, that is his message, they were cut to the heart. Conviction. I felt it. Many of you know what I'm talking about, where it, it's just like you're sitting there and you're hearing. I remember those early days of hearing the gospel and the impact it was having on me. They were cut to the heart and they said, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. Hmm. And then he says, and uh, so those who received his word, we read, were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now that, that word repent, let me go back to this. The word repent and be baptized. Repent is, is metanoia. It just means uh, to turn around. Turn towards God. You're going this way. You're living your own life for yourself. It's turn away from your sin. Sin is just ignoring God, rebelling against God, doing what I want to do instead of what God wants me to do. That repentance is simply turning away from myself and instead going towards God. It's, it's, it's synonymous with the term that we also have for faith, which is to de depend on it. It's the, it's the other side of the same coin. You turn from yourself to where you can depend on God and trust in Jesus. And then we have the word uh, baptize, which, uh, which we, uh, we find that they did then in verse 41, that they were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, when you read this, 3,000 people were baptized. You gotta wonder, how in the world this happened? Because we know in the first century, all baptisms, in fact, for the first 300 years of Christianity, all baptisms were immersions. And so how in the world do you baptize 3,000 adults in one day? Seems impossible. And skeptics have said, well, there's no river in Jerusalem. There's no large body of water that they could have gone to. Sure, there's some pools and stuff, but those are separate. There's no way you're going to get 3,000 people in a single day. Uh, and then uh, what's interesting is, while there was being some excavations around the Temple Mount, it was not that long ago, they came across something that we, we know about. We, we found these in other places in Israel. It's called a mikvah. It was a ceremonial immersion tank that the Jews would use to symbolize purification. Well, they found, after they unearthed this, they, be, they continued with the excavation, and to date, they found over 125 of these mikvahs immediately around the temple, presumably so that the Jews could use, the, could use it for their purity as they go into the temple. 125 plus, and some say that there's probably going to be over 200 by the time they get to it. So that explains it. Well, this is how you, you divide that 3,000 by 12, and it certainly is possible. And if they included some of the other 120, it's very, it makes a perfect sense. This is how they were able to do it. And so Peter says, repent. 3,000 people say, I'm in. And they get baptized to prove that they were doing so. Imagine the excitement that day. The cheering, 
the celebration, the tears. Man, what a day. It doesn't end there. Look at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So now they do church. They got together and they worshiped. They humbly sat under the teaching of the apostles. And Jesus' great commission also says, go and witness, but he also said, then teach them to obey all the things that I've commanded you. And verse 41, they're doing just that. They're teaching them. They're learning. So what does it look like to follow Jesus in our daily lives? What's it look like to follow Jesus in our marriage? What does it look like to follow Jesus while we're at work? What does it look like to parent in a godly way? What does it look like to live holy, to fight temptation, to love your neighbor? They sat under practical teaching. They lived in community. They had fellowship. They did life together. They ate meals together. They talked about parenting, marriage, and purity together. And they prayed and welcomed God into their midst. In verse 43, an awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. That is that flurry of activity of the Holy Spirit that had started was still going on through the 12 apostles. And then I love verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now this mega church, and it was a mega church, 3,000 on the first day, not too many days after this, 5,000 more people were added in a single day. So this mega church was together. Doesn't mean that they agreed on everything. Doesn't mean that they were the, the same. They, they had different backgrounds, different perspectives, different opinions about stuff. This first doesn't mean that everyone in church agrees on everything. I mean, that would be a cult. It means that they were tied together. Well, they had different opinions, but they had Jesus in common and that was enough for them. To them, Jesus meant more than their culture, their ethnicity, their politics, their opinions. And to live in true community means that you sacrifice your minor opinions, and they were happy to do so. The quickest way to break up healthy community is to be opinionated about dumb stuff, being legalistic or focused on rules. Those things kill churches, friendships, families, small groups, and I think our mental health. This group majored on the majors. Jesus is God. He rose from the dead. That's what mattered. Now, some of us struggle to engage in community in the church because I think we struggle with this. It's so easy for us to get amped up about dumb little stuff that ultimately isn't going to matter when we're thinking about eternity. Well, this early church, they model it perfectly. Major on the majors. Love your brother more than you love your views. Love your church more than your opinions. And then we look down in verse 45. It says, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Because when you love someone, you notice their needs. This church was so tightly knit. They were constantly looking at the needs of their brothers and sisters and doing what it took to meet them. And it's beautiful. And I look at this and, and I see this in our church. We have such a generous church. In the past months, we've seen people give cars to others in the church, pay for others' education. To love someone is to meet their needs. That's the church. And I love that this is also our church. Verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Their humility, their generosity, their sense of community, it made the whole city better. Jerusalem loved it. Even those who weren't part of the group, they loved the church. And because of this, people were drawn in and their attendance increased. It all started in Jerusalem. And the world will soon taste it after this and never be the same. And we get to experience it today because of what started here. And Acts 2, in many ways, 
churches today are still trying to get back to our roots. But the beginning of the chapter, it's exciting. Many churches try to recreate that, the exciting, emotional flurry. But our calling is to recreate the end of the chapter, having all things in common, generosity, praising God, favor with the people, growing. So let's look at, just kind of wrap this up, a few lessons from our family. And number one, aim for the bees. That's what they did, aim for the bees. You look at this day, there was this huge crowd that had gathered because of the miracles that God had brought as he gave the Holy Spirit. Peter then gets up and he brings a spellbinding message and people are like, okay, okay, we're in, we're in. What do we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. So here's the bees, belief and baptism. And we talk, when we use the word belief or faith sometimes, the, the word is faith. The, the, it's the Greek word pistuo, which means to trust or to depend, to just trust in him, depend on him. And when he says, when he says be baptized, it's the word baptizo, which means to be immersed. And because that's what the Jews did for their purification practices, and literally baptizo, that's what it means, to be immersed. So they always practiced immersion for the first 300 years. And, uh, and it signified for these early Christians Jesus' resurrection. So when they were, would get baptized, they were proclaiming that as Jesus rose again from the dead, I have been resurrected from spiritual death and I have Christ in me. I am now resurrected, living this new resurrected life. So that's it, the bees, that's it. And of course, there's learning and, and there's practicing, but the early church kept it simple and we should as well. So first lesson, aim for the bees. Second lesson is, a sign of change is sharing. How do you know if someone is on a keto diet? Yeah, don't worry about it, they're gonna tell you. <laughs> Why? Because when something changes your life, you naturally talk about it, whether it's a gym or a baby or a diet or a book or a podcast, and you see that with the early church. They shared their story. And Peter, before this, he was, he was a scared puppy. He was he, he, had, he was hiding out. He was afraid that the Romans were gonna come after him just like they had crucified Jesus. And now he's standing out in the streets boldly proclaiming, what happened? He had been transformed. The Holy Spirit had come into his life and had given him this power and this strength. And he shared his story courageously. Do you? Do your coworkers know that you follow Jesus? That you love him? That he's, that he's the most important thing to you? Your neighbors, extended family, your high school friends, do they know that you follow Jesus? Well, these early Christians, because a sign of change is sharing, they shared their story. They also shared their stuff. Because when your heart is gripped, I mean, giving just happens. It's like that Sarah McLaughlin commercial. You ever see that with the dogs, those Sad little dogs in the arms of the angels showing dogs in cages with sad faces. And man, people flooded that charity with cash because they can't stand to see sad dogs. It gripped their hearts, but the gripping of the hearts meant you do something about that when your heart is gripped. Or my kids growing up, I, there was some once in a while I, I would see there was something that they were fixated on, interested in, either at the mall or Walmart or wherever, and, and didn't even ask for it. It wasn't Christmas, their birthday wasn't coming up. And just because I saw it was something that they really wanted, my heart went out to it, and, and I would buy unnecessary junk. A, a sign of your heart being gripped is you become generous. And a sign of a healthy church is that kind of love for each other is gonna lead to generosity. And again, it's why I love this church. Twice last year, our giving went above and beyond what we needed. If you remember last May when we were doing a capital campaign for launching our North Shore location, we needed to raise a million dollars and you guys gave two and we said, stop, no, no, just give half of what you were gonna give because it's too much. That is a generous church. And right now in a time when churches are struggling and the market is unstable, but this community gives. I think of many of you have donated cars, cars that are driven by other families right now in this same church sharing. Or many of you showed up uh, at the church offices over Christmas giving piles of gift cards to give to other church members who were down and out. And we didn't ask for them, just decided to give. 
because the heart of our community is gripped by Jesus and we just can't help ourselves. And number three, healthy things grow. That's true. Healthy things grow. We see this twice at the end of chapter two, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were growing spiritually in humility. They sat under this teaching, not to critique it, but to grow. And then in verse 47, it says, the Lord added to their number 3,000, became 3,500 to 4,000, and just continued to grow. It, it, it's actually become normative in some church circles to demonize any church talking about numbers and how many people are coming. And they say, numbers don't matter. I don't know, I mean, God named a book in the Bible, Numbers. But also, uh, we see here, the early church is counting numbers, and they did. You go, continue on through the book of Acts, and they continue to count. Because every number is a soul, and all souls matter. We're talking heaven and hell. Numbers matter. They're not everything, but they matter because they matter to God. As a church, we had people say, well, you just want to get big, be a big church. My answer is, yes! Of course, absolutely, because that's what Jesus wants. Lots of people worshiping him, and that's what attacking the gates of hell does. One, one person on their way to hell, now they're part of God's kingdom. We want to do that over and over and over and over. And we're going to count every one of those, because heaven does, and they party over every single conversion. And sure, We'll hit periods where growth is harder to come by. There's seasons of sifting. And just because one church is bigger than another doesn't make it better. And some areas are more primed for numeric growth than other areas. But here in Acts 2, we see growth in two areas. There's the spiritual growth as they receive the teaching of God's word in their lives and numeric growth. And both of those mattered to the early church. Well, the world had never seen anything like it before. And this is our family history. One that should make us proud and yet give us a healthy weight to carry that baton, to keep this going. It's why we exist. This is Madison. She's my oldest granddaughter. She's 10, but she's going on 85. <laughs> And I just love it. She's an old lady at heart, and, and she's a blast. And what you see there, she's holding a pocket watch. An interesting story behind that pocket watch. Late last spring, Nicole w was working one day, and uh, I think it might have been spring break, or the kids were off, had, had the day off and available. And, and Junior called me up, and he said, hey, uh, you want to fly us to Iowa? <laughs> oh, really? And it, the kids, it's, it's kind of funny, especially Madison. Her favorite show on TV is is American Pickers. Have you ever seen American Pickers? Antique archaeology is their location in, in La Clara, Iowa. And he said, you want to fly us there? I want to take the kids to antique archaeology. And while we were at the, the store, which, which is right in front of the store, while we were there, she found this watch and she started talking about it. She started imagining, and she was sure it was an old man, the old man who had this pocket watch. And she, and she was thinking about him pulling it out, looking at it and checking the time. And she gave it to me. And actually, nobody had tried winding it. She didn't even know that you're supposed to wind a watch because, you know, we're in a different generation now. So I wound it up. And lo and behold, the thing worked. She put it in her purse. And every couple of minutes, she'd pull it out, check the time, pull it back in, you know, <laughs> just pulling out her purse. And look. When she got home, she put it away, wrapped it up in cloth and put it in a box. And whenever there were other kids coming over, she would take that box and hide it into her closet <laughs> because it was so very special to her. It reminds me of when Jesus said, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now, of course, Jesus was talking about that humble attitude and eagerness to accept but along with that is this application of an appreciation and love for what I've been given. The kingdom of God. Man, forget an old watch. We've been given something far more precious. We've been given a new life, a new mission. We've been given the church, the body of Christ. Are you living with that 
childlike awe? Do you see his church that way, the way he sees it? And oh sure, imperfect, with faults, <laughs> but a beautiful community with rich history. God's kingdom. The church is a precious baton worth carrying and passing on. A movement fueled by the thousands who've gone before us. Have you joined in their sacrifice? Are you faithfully carrying the baton? Are you living for the mission? Loving his family? Telling everyone you can about it? This is a community that Jesus himself says he's coming back for. The bride of Christ. He just can't keep his eye off the church. Are you bought in? And Father, I thank you for this, this great reminder as we look through the beginnings of the church and the church of Christ was born. I pray that as we consider what we have looked at today, we'd also do some introspection. Speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Individually, in whatever way that you decide. In fact, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, this is a great time to allow him to speak. This is what we call our so what moment, but you can just keep your heads bowed and eyes closed as we consider this. Here's the, here's the question. What is your next step? These people said, what should we do now? What is your next step? Maybe for some of you, it's actually to come to that place of believing, that repentance that Peter talked about, turning around, turning to God, resting in Jesus. And if you've done that, have you been baptized? Maybe that's your next step. He wants you to identify now and publicly proclaim, yeah, I'm, I'm with Jesus. I'm resting in his resurrection. Or maybe, maybe, it's, maybe you've taken those steps, but you're just not ever talking about it. Maybe that's the next step. You have God's Holy Spirit living in you if you believe on Jesus. You have this uncanny, supernatural ability to speak in such a way that God speaks on the inside as you say things on the outside. So are, are you doing that? Are you telling others? Are you making invitations? So God, I thank you for what we have talked about and I thank you for how you've spoken. I pray that we walk away different now because of the decisions that we're making even right now and that this will change us. In Jesus' name.